Hey, Mary, are you there? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just pulling stuff up. Cool, sounds good. I'm, I'm uh, recording this, so we're, we should be all set. Cool. All right, thanks, Mary. <laughs>
Hey, Debbie. Hey, Pat. Good morning, hi, Mary. Or, oh, hi. Mm. It's, still, it's still morning here. Eh, 11.55. It, it counts as morning. <laughs> well, it, I'm on central time. Right. How are you guys doing? Pretty good. All right. Thank you. You at home, Mary? No, I'm actually in the lab, but I forgot I have I made this uh, background from they changed the love sign in front of Montpelier to say vote. Um, oh. So that's uh, I forgot I keep forgetting that I put that on as a fake background and then um, until I'm on a call. <laughs> hey Debbie, hey Pat, can't wait. Good morning. Hi Matt. How are you all doing? Good, thanks. Hey. Debbie, can't wait to see you. Oh, I am so excited. Over a week. I know, I know. I'm cannot wait to be there. And good to see you, Bob. How are you? Uh, I'm great, thank you. And see, John's and John just signed on. Hey, John. Hey, man. How you doing? Good, good. So what is the weather like there? Today, the high is 80, but this morning it was probably in the upper 50s. Yesterday, the, it was, the low was in the upper 30s, but the high was in the 60s. So it definitely feels like fall. Um, cold at night and beautiful, like blue sky, comfortable during the day. Oh, that sounds just perfect. Yeah, it's been really lovely the past the past couple of weeks. Looking ahead the for the program by next the end of next week, it'll probably be in the um, mid 40s in the morning and then 60s during the day. So it's definitely getting into the cooler side of things. Like th th this is the last weekend. It's going to be, you know, in the 50s at night. I was looking at this for camping with my daughter, so that's why we're going on Friday. So. <laughs> But you guys <clears throat> get fall about a month before we do, so I'm really eager to get a little early taste of that. Yeah, it it's definitely been unseasonably cool uh, this September, so who knows? But we got um, kind of once Sally came through here, brought a bunch of rain and kind of cooled everything down. Well, here in Texas in August, 28 of the 31 days were 100 degrees or higher. So I am really looking forward to getting into some cooler weather. I've been following the weather with my son Cole, who lives in Denton, and right. it's just very hot. So he doesn't mind it. So he's used to the summer heat here in Virginia. Well, it's like my sister lives in Los Angeles, and one day she called me and she said, it's 110 degrees here. And I said, oh, I guess I shouldn't tell you it was 57 this morning. <laughs> I'm from the East Coast, but we've lived in California for 40 years. And that day that it was 112 or whatever in LA, the poor avocado trees, it looked like somebody took a blowtorch to them. Oh. I've, got a, I've got a tree I've grown from a seed and uh, it was a battle. I, every two hours, I went out and watered it down. Oh, did you save it? It, it? it survived. It survived. Okay. Yeah, but it it's great for growing things. So I'll send you tomatoes when it's winter time. <laughs> it, it took about five years to get used to growing things here. Yeah, we get spoiled around here. 
this year I abandoned my vegetable garden and then it just kept growing things I had planted years in the past, but hadn't planted this year. So all of a sudden tomato plants were coming up and squashes and cucumbers, um, kind of willy nilly all over the place. So next um, Wednesday, next Wednesday, I start teaching a virtual gardening class to first graders. Oh, so fun. It's an, it's an experiment in life. It's the only thing that I like about the pandemic. <laughs> All right. Well, I see more people are kind of hopping on. Some familiar faces, some new faces. This is very exciting. Um, we are going to continue our series of do you know what this is with talking about uh, iron stuff or as I titled it rusty metal things. Um, this is going to be a, a we're going to kind of follow the same format for those of you who have hopped on these in the past um, uh, with kind of talking about uh, different types of resources but this is a little a little different because iron is really hard <laughs> in my opinion because when you see it, you usually see it broken, covered in rust. So all those sort of diagnostic shape things that are normally really helpful aren't there. The other thing is that it's primarily utilitarian. So when you're finding it, you're finding pieces often of bigger things. Um, so you're trying to narrow down to what is that one piece of that larger thing. You don't have lovely things like hand painted decorations on it like you do on ceramics to point you in the right direction. Um, the other things that I think make iron really hard is that just like anything else um, in archaeology, we have to know a little bit about everything, but to really be able to identify iron, you have to really know a little bit about everything, machines and tools and cooking and blacksmithing and all of this kind of stuff. And um, so if you're finding rusty metal things at your house uh, or when you're digging in your garden, or when you're teaching first graders how to garden, um, you uh, might have a harder time trying to identify them. Um, particularly because I don't imagine most of you have a, a, a conservation uh, set up at home. Certainly some people do. Often folks that come on our metal detecting program have figured out how to set up a whole a home conservation um, unit, but uh, it can be, uh, sometimes a little complicated because it is it is chemistry and does involve electricity and water so <laughs> just be uh, cautious if that is a thing you want to explore um but uh we'll just kind of get into it uh i have uh put together a little presentation for you all like in the years or uh, in the programs past um but if we want to pull some stuff out i have my handy dandy gloves with me which are really important whenever you're dealing with any kind of iron that's been conserved. It's the one thing um, that archaeologists don't just regularly touch with their hands is um, iron that's gone or, <clears throat> excuse me, any artifact that's gone through the conservation process because the oils and greases in your hands will start to undo um, what you've so carefully worked to get out. So normally you're seeing us stick stuff in our mouths and bang it against our teeth and lick it and do all of these kinds of things with our artifacts. But once they go through conservation, we're much more judicious with how we handle them. We're much more cautious. We look more like a traditional uh, museum curatorial staff with our gloves on and, and sort of our, our cautious nature and not sticking things in our mouths. Um, all right. So, I'm going to pull some stuff up for you all. Let's see. There we go. Everybody can see that? Yes. Great. Thank you. So, <clears throat> As you can see, do you know what this thing is? Rusty metal things. All right, iron artifacts. Like I said, they can be really difficult to identify because iron was used for so many different things. And when we find it, it's often broken or covered in rust or both. Um, but there's lots of different types of iron artifacts. Uh, all kinds of fasteners, primarily nails um, is the main thing we find, but nails, screws, nuts, bolts, those types of things. Architectural hardware, like what you see in the picture here, this is a shutter dog. Uh, shutter dogs are the things that hold shutters open. Um, 
but also hinges, locks, window pulleys, window weights, um, pentels, all sorts of uh, things relating to buildings. Set up. I'm sorry, what? Okay. Um, carriage and horse hardware. So all the things relating to carriages, bridles for horses, saddles, bits, um, even horseshoes. Um, lots of things related to cooking and preparing food, as well as fire, so pots, kettles, tools, um, ash scoops, all sorts of things like that. Machine parts, uh, our most famous machine here at Montpelier is our wheat threshing machine, um, but certainly all sorts of different machine parts um, can be found. Uh, I, uh, there's an archaeological site in Milton, Florida, uh, where I have a friend that runs it, where it was a lumber mill. It also had a bucket factory. It also even had a textile mill on it um, uh, at one point. And so they find tons and tons of machine parts, and they had to do a lot of research to figure out which parts were associated with machines for lumber, which were for textiles, which were for buckets, which were for shingle making, all sorts of different types of things. Um, tools for farming, for carpentry, for other sort of activities, and of course things associated with blacksmithing, um, the, the tools you need to blacksmith with, but also kind of the scrap or, or residual blacksmith um, work. So these are just the main categories of things, but certainly lots of other, other things show up in iron, and certainly things we went over in small finds, uh, in our small finds talk, like little buckles and um, uh, buttons, things like that as well. So again, some of my favorite resources. So because iron is uh, really complicated, uh, some of the things that I really like to look at are this first one, which are trade catalogs. And a lot of these are available online through the Winter Tour Digital Collection. Um, uh, trade catalogs are like what you see in this picture on the bottom left. So they were literally catalogs made in the, seven, uh, in the 17 and uh, early 1800s where they would have these hand-drawn images of all of the different things that you could option to order. So this one is for a page out of a trade catalog for um, metal objects relating to uh, carriages and horse harnesses. So these are all buckles relating to horse harnesses right here. Um, so you can pick from the catalog and you'll see there's little numbers written by each of them. So you can say, I want buckle number 107. And this is true for hinges, for lamps. Uh, they even have one at Winter Tour for commode handles. Um, all of these uh, trade catalogs are, are available online from the Winter Tour digital collections, which they're really, really neat um, and give you a really good idea of the kinds of things that, that you can be finding. Um, again, the DAX cataloging manual has some really nice um, uh, pictures in it. We don't catalog exactly the same way as, as they do over there, but a lot of the images they were um, used are really helpful. Um, the next down uh, is an article called Nail Chronology as an Aid to Dating Old Buildings. You will actually see a lot of images uh, from this article in this presentation um, for uh, identifying different types of nails. Um, so this article is also available online in a PDF form for the public um, by the National Park Service. Um, some other books that I really like, um, and some of them are not specifically for iron, but can be really helpful. So the Field Guide to American Houses um, is a nice one that just kind of has a lot of images of different types of American domestic architecture. And initially, it's not really designed to help you with sort of the specifics of, you know, doorknobs or locks or hinges, but sometimes it just really helps to see a lot of pictures of buildings to understand where metal or iron could show up and what kind of things to look for. I feel like so often we forget about the kinds of little detailed um, components uh, that could be made of iron. Um, the one below it, a similar, again, is based on architecture, so the everyday ar architecture of the Mid-Atlantic. Um, that one's another one, again, to kind of help us better understand um, sort of the big picture of the building and how these little uh, bits of iron might fit, fit into it. The next one down is Antique Iron, a survey of American and English forms. This one is fantastic. It really helps a lot in um, when we have what we call here um, diagnostic shape function unknown, 
which is when someone sends down a piece of iron and we're like, it's a thing, but we have no idea what it is. But we know that the shape is distinguishable enough that someone who knows more could, could help us identify it. So a lot of times I'll go to that book. Um, of course, the Guide to Artifacts in Colonial America. And then talking to people that know a lot, blacksmiths. Uh, there's a lot of people that do blacksmithing as hobbies and even as professionals today. So at least once a year, uh, a blacksmith sort of colleague and friend of ours comes and he looks through all of our conserved iron that we've excavated and conserved that year and helps us um, either re-identify it, uh, more detail identify it, or even looking for things like where a blacksmith might have done repairs or adjustments to the artifact to, to have better understand its history. Metal detectors, of course, they're finding metal all the time, so it's really helpful to talk to them. Architectural historians, um, we, when we find anything that looks like a hinge or maybe part of a building, we always run it by our um, architectural historians on the property. Uh, Jen Glass is who we run our things by. Unfortunately, unfortunately uh, Jen just got uh, an amazing position at Colonial Williamsburg, so she's going to be leaving us next month. Um, so it's going to be really hard to run things by her uh, from afar, but uh, we hope that we'll have another architectural historian here to help with that. For dealing with iron, you're going to need a couple of things. A magnet, of course, to tell you if it really is iron. Also, to tell you how much iron is left. If you look at something that looks like a big ball of rust and you stick a magnet to it and it doesn't react, the iron could all be gone and you could be just left the rust. Um, a steel bristle brush. Uh, is really good for getting off any kind of dirt, uh, sort of preliminary uh, rust, a toothbrush, again, for getting off dirt, bamboo skewers, dental tools, any of those kinds of things for picking off uh, uh, um, dirt or rust. Ideally, if you're doing anything with iron, you want an x-ray machine. I don't know many of us that have one of these just sort of lying around, but most um, archeologists and, and conservators before removing rust from an object will actually x-ray it first. This gives you an idea of how much iron is actually there versus the, the rust around it, sort of the quality of it. Um, you'll want lots of references like the things we just went over and you're also gonna need your imagination for iron. Iron often doesn't look like what it's supposed to when it comes out of the ground. So you have to really be able to think um, creatively of seeing something as a whole picture and with big globs of rust removed. So I mentioned conservation and I wanted to give you a very quick intro into, into iron conservation. Um, so overall, the goal of conservation is to reduce the effects of degradation by changing the chemical processes. So it's a little different than restoration or, or some other similar uh, related fields. Uh, conservation protects artifacts for the long term. So you, um, for iron in particular, you reverse the rusting and then you prevent rusting in the future. Ideally, whenever you wanna do any type of conservation, you wanna do it um, in a way that is reversible in case you make a mistake. Um, and also, in case the, the, the chemical process starts over again. So in case it starts to rust again, you want to be able to remove whatever you did in order to treat it. Um, and it's really closely connected to chemistry. So you can see in this picture, the key on the left is pre-conservation. The key on the right is after conservation. The rust has been removed. Protective coatings have been applied to the key to prevent rust in the, rusting in the future. Um, this little uh, drawing below, you may have seen it up in the lab over our conservation station, but it's a little diagram of, of how our electrolytic reduction works. But let's go over some of the basic steps. So the first thing that happens in conservation is our field crew digs up something iron that they think we should conserve. Maybe it's something particularly interesting or large or diagnostic. We don't conserve every nail because we find so many of them. Um, that's all we'd ever do if you were conserving all our nails. But interesting pieces, large pieces, unique objects, um, like a lot of the ones you'll see in this presentation get conserved. So they dig it up, uh, they wrap it up in a tinfoil burrito. So basically wrap the iron object in dirt, wrapped in tinfoil, put it in a bag and send it down to the lab. When it comes down to the lab, we catalog it um, and we take a before photo. Basically, we're giving this artifact a makeover, and you can't do a makeover without a before photo. So that is always one of the first things we do. 
It's also really important in case something goes wrong in the conservation process that you have the artifact documented and conservation can go wrong. If you um, put a bunch of things in to be conserved and you disappear for a month and come back, the artifact itself can be totally destroyed. Um, so it's really important to uh, document all the steps along the way. So the next step is uh, you can do mechanical or chemical cleaning. And usually we do a combination of both. Um, so mechanical cleaning is when we use this contraption, which is our sandblaster, as well as dremels, picks, dental tools, brushes, all of those methods to remove the rust. Chemical cleaning, we use electrolytic reduction, um, usually in combination with mechanical cleaning. Now this amazing tank is not our tank. For those of you who've been to the lab, you've seen our tanks are, are quite small little tubs, but Electrolytic reduction can be done on an absolutely huge scale where you can fit an entire cannon into a tank or, or some really large objects. Um, after all the rust is removed, either mechanically or chemically or in the combination of both, uh, we boil our artifacts. So that uh, removes any impurities that got onto the artifact from being handled by a bunch of people. Um, it also, uh, 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 deals with the ions that have been absorbed into the artifact. Finally, we bake it. Uh, we have a little oven in the archeology span lab. Uh, it is not for making cookies, it is for drying out artifacts. So we put it at a very low temperature in the oven because even though iron doesn't seem porous at all, that boiling process, the handling process, it will have absorbed some water. So we wanna make sure all of the water is out because if we don't get all the water out, the rusting process will just start over again. Um, Finally, we gave it a quick little last cleaning. You can see um, folks using Dremels here. And that last little cleaning is just getting whatever last little bit of rust off of the artifact that needs to get off. And then we coat it. Um, we use two chemicals here. The one on the left is a tannic acid solution. Um, the tannic acid is an anti-corrosive. It also recolors the artifacts. So when you see conserved artifacts that look very black, like a wrought iron, that's the tannic acid. And then we give it a, a top coat, um, which is the chemical to the right. It's called B72. Um, it has an acetone base to it. And it really works like um, a clear coat of nail polish that you would put on top of the color. It is a protective coat, gives a little bit of shine, um, but really kind of keeps uh, the, the chemicals out, uh, the dirt out all from um, getting on the artifact. Both of these um, chemicals, these coatings can be removed uh, with acetone, um, uh, alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, and some other really pretty simple um, methods. So they're good chemicals to use because they can um, uh, be removed pretty easily. Finally, we take an after photograph. So it's gotten its makeover, it needs an after photograph and then we store it. And so if you ever see these plastic tubs in the lab, all of our conserved iron is stored in those. And in each of those plastic tubs, we have a little desiccant, kind of like the things you, um, those little bags of crystals that come in a new pair of shoes, um, which absorb uh, the moisture. And we check the desiccants and we check the, uh, the artifacts to make sure little bits of um, uh, moisture has been absorbed isn't in the boxes, but also that little bits of iron aren't coming back onto the artifact. So that is a super quick rundown on iron conservation. Um, so I want to talk a little bit now about some of the artifacts that we find. Uh, nails, Montpelier gold, Matt's favorite, uh, Matt's favorite artifact. So why are nails so exciting? Um, we find them in abundance, which is really helpful. Um, but they're excellent for dating sites and buildings. So uh, nail manufacture changes uh, really through the periods of occupation of this property. So they're really helpful for dating both um, standing structures as well as archeological sites. Um, uh, collections of nails are also really good for indicating where buildings were. If you have a whole bunch of nails in one area, it is likely that there is a building there. Um, so that's really what we're looking for in our metal detecting survey. So you can see the image below. Uh, the little red boxes are places where we've metal detected where there's a whole bunch of hits or a whole bunch of artifacts. And most of those artifacts are going to be nails. Um, there's three main types of manufacture of nails, which are hand wrought nails, machine cut nails, and wire nails. 
um, hand wrought being the oldest, then machine cut, and then wire being modern nails. And those large categories in and of themselves are really helpful for dating, but there's even subcategories within them that help us um, data site or, or a structure. So at Montpelier, we have our, our building um, episodes. So the earliest construction of the main house of Montpelier looked something like what you see here, the 1765 to 1796. This is when um, James Madison Sr. would've had the original house built. And the type of nails that would've been used in, in that construction of the house are hand wrought nails, so made entirely by a blacksmith, um, with a rose head, so that basically means it was, the head was hammered four times on the top that makes it look uh, like a rose. Um, <laughs> uh, Matt just said this is his favorite slide, um, which I totally stole from him. So I should give him credit. These are, <laughs> so this, this is his slide. We might see a couple others that look really familiar. Um, but you can also look at the tips of these nails that are pointed or having sort of a flattened spatula tip. Let's see. The next one you can see is the expansion of the main house. So 1797 to 1807. This is um, James has married Dolly Madison. He builds sort of the townhouse adjacent to the main house because he doesn't want to be in the exact same spot of his mother. He wants to be able to go out and have to knock on a door before she can come into his house or uh, he can go into her house. <laughs> um, um, and the nail times change for this building period. So this is when we start to get machine cut nails, particularly these L-headed ones um, with, again, a spatula or a pointed tit, tip or a machine cut shank with a hand wrought head, so applied by a blacksmith. And then sort of what we see Montpelier to look like today, uh, sort of the last big building episode that help, happens during um, Madison's um, uh, second term of his presidency and into his retirement. Um, you see, again, machine cut uh, nails, but they are a little different in how they're manufactured. So they have their, what they call side pitch. We'll go into this in a little bit more. And then finally, uh, 1848 to 1901. So what Montpelier looked like after Madison's and before the DuPonts, you get these uh, machine face pinch nails. Um, so a little of these nails you'll still see today, but not so many. And then later on in the 20th century, you get the wire nails, like what we think of as a nail you would get at Home Depot. So this is really, really, really helpful for us to have these building episodes, be able to connect the nails that we're finding in the structures themselves with the nails that we're finding in the outbuildings or the other structures across the property. It's a really incredibly helpful way to date this site where we can get on almost into a micro dating, um, site specific dating. So hand wrought nails. So this um, illustration at the top is from that article that I referenced in the beginning from the National Park Service. A lot of these uh, uh, images are from that and they're really helpful for understanding how nails are made. Most of us don't think that often about how nails are made. Um, I do wanna point out these nails on the bottom left, these beautiful spatula tipped rosehead nails. Um, they have been burned. So you see hardly any rust on them, but they're kind of almost a, a dark red color. Nails, when they get burned, it prevents them from rusting. So they're in amazing condition when they come out of the ground like this. And they're really, really um, quite beautiful. They almost look brand new, except for that, that red coloring to them. We found actually quite a few burned nails at the overseer's excavations, which has been really fun. So there's two different types of heads on um, these, uh, these wrought nails. The rose head, which you see, um, uh, uh, the, the, the rose head nails that you see here, and then the, um, the headless ones. So head, no head. Um, so that's a really nice way to help us identify nails. Um, hand wrought nails tend to be very square in shape. Um, the, the shape of the shank is quite square. Um, and the rose head is pretty identifiable. So this tends to be the one nail that if folks can identify it, this tends to be the one. Um, there's also these T-headed or these downturn nails where instead of the nail being hit, uh, head being hit four times to make that little rose head, it's hit really hard twice to kind of fold the head around the tip of the, the, the top of the nail shank. Um, so looking at the bottom of the nail, you have the pointed tip or the spatula tip. 
And you can see here in this drawing of how the spatula tip can really split the wood. It seems almost counterintuitive to have a blunt tip of a nail, but it actually is incredibly helpful for splitting with the grain of the wood. Um, and then a lot of nails look like this when we find them. They have these sort of curly bottoms. Sometimes the nail itself is, is shaped like an L and sometimes it's got this curly, curly bottom. Um, we would call this a clinched nail. So this is a really good idea that the nail was hammered into something where the nail itself would stick out the back. So if you can imagine hammering a nail into a door and the door is so thin that if um, the nail, the tip of the nail would stick out the back of the door, you would then hammer the nail back either flat or into a curly shape so you don't have um, spikes po poking out at you. So if you ever hear the expression like dead as a doornail, it comes from this idea of clinching or um, kind of bending the end of the nail. Nails were really expensive at different points in history um, and very valuable. Um, they were often reused. So buildings could be torn apart or burned down and the nails all pulled for them and reused into a different building. But when a nail was clenched like this, um, they couldn't be easily pulled out. So they couldn't easily be reused. So that's that idea of being dead as a doornail is that it's dead, it can't be um, reused or repurposed. So machine cut nails, weirdly enough, are, are my favorite type of nails, if, if one would have a favorite type of nail. Um, and I really like this illustration. Again, it's from that National Park Service uh, uh, article where you can see there's basically a flat pa um, plate of iron that's being fed into a shear that's cutting out these little sort of flat rectangular to triangular shaped shanks of a nail. Um, so a, a, a machine cut nail tends to be more rectangular while a um, hand wrap nail tends to be a little bit more square. It has a flatness to it, often a bluntness to it. Um, they're just really cool. And often you can see sort of the effects of being um, sort of the cut marks of the nail. So you can see on the bottom left, here's a machine cut nail, but with a rot head. So the shank is cut out and then a head is attached. And then you can see here is a different machine cut nail with that L head. Um, this is a machine cut nail that is side pinched. And what that means, and you can see on a, a real nail, this little arrow is pointing right under the head. You'll often see a pinching. Um, so this is pinched on the side. So on the narrowest sides of the nail get pinched in um, as opposed to one here that is face pinched. So this is a little later. So instead of on the narrow sides being pinched in up by the head, it's pinched in on the broader flat sides. Um, so that's a, how you can tell those, those apart. And this is what one of those would look like. We also then have, of course, wire nails. So those are our round wire nails. They look like the nails you buy at Home Depot or Lowe's today. They're basically the exact same technology. They're quite round, they're shiny. Um, and we have those beginning in the beginning of the 20th century all the way up to today. So this is a really great way if you can get some good quality nails, you can make amazing um, interpretations of not only the datings of structures, but of archeological sites. You can understand if archeological, if buildings were intentionally brought down and if the nails were all salvaged. You can also um, see where extensions or expansions of a building are by sort of the change in nails where repairs were made. It can be really, really helpful for understanding um, the life cycle of a building. So other things that help us understand a building is the architectural hardware. We have a lot of really cool architectural hardware here, but this is just to give you some of the ideas. And I included kind of for the rest of the presentation, these sort of before and after shots of um, artifacts that have gone through the conservation process. So the one on the top left here, this is a, a window pulley. Um, for raising and lowering a window. So the outside is iron and then the wheel inside, I believe, is a cupric alloy. Um, here's again that key, sort of the before and after. And you can see below this diagram of the parts of a key. So each of the parts of the keys um, can tell you a little bit about the kind of lock it was used for, the dating of the key. These are the kinds of areas, whether it's the shoulder, the shaft, the bow, the pin, the bit, all of those keys, those can all help you 
understand what kind of lock it went to. Um, and there are a variety of different kinds of locks. So what you're seeing in the bottom right is what a whole plate stock lock would look like. And what you're seeing um, on the left is what one looks like when we find it in the ground, um, front and back, and what it looks like after it comes out of conservation. So this is the metal part that would stick into a, a wooden box. And you can sort of see the key that would go with it. That's sort of the front of it. Um, and this is one that we have conserved in house here, which is really pretty interesting. Um, we also find sort of um, what's called a, a, a Bradbury um, or a Banbury, I'm sorry, a Banbury uh, locks and keys, which are similar to this one, but they have more wood and less iron, doesn't have this big, nice plate. And then of course, ones that are entirely made out of metal. Um, and so kind of the more wood of the lock, the cheaper the lock is, the more metal, the more expensive it is. And then the more incorporation of other metals besides iron, like brass um, or other sort of copper alloys, the more expensive it's gonna be and more decorative. So it's really helpful um, to understand sort of the technologies of these locks, but also the economic scaling of them. Um, carriage and horse hardware. There is a whole bunch of different types of carriage and horse hardware. And I wanna kind of talk about these illustrations first. So the one on the top right is from an illustration I found um, on the website for the uh, Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, which is another resource to look for drawings because this is a plan for a carriage, a, a late 18th century um, French design for a carriage to give you an idea of parts and, and pieces. Below that is a page from one of those trade catalogs for carriage hardware. So these are the types of hinges you could pick to order for your carriage, from an incredibly simple one with no decoration to incredibly elaborate ones. So you, the, the range is just absolutely huge. And um, this trade catalog is pretty contemporaneous with the, that design that you see above, so late 18th century. Um, but then we also find all of the things related to horses. Probably the most common thing we find are horseshoes or fragments of horseshoes, as, as well as mule shoes or oxen shoes, um, but also parts of bits. So the, the before and after you see here is, is part of a horse bit. Um, so of course, all the different horse harness uh, pieces related as well. And again, you'll find these very um, kind of more utilitarian versions in, um, in iron, while the more decorative versions are gonna often show up in, in those finer metals. There's also a whole lot of artifacts relating to cooking and fire. And these can be big spoons, they can be big tongs, they can be ash scoops. But a lot of what we find is what you see on the left here, which are pieces of cast iron pots or Dutch ovens or, or kettles. So this is the bottom of one. And then this one I think is really cool, which is not necessarily cooking, but is definitely fire related. Um, this is a piece that would be sort of the, the thing that holds your logs in your fireplace is, is the decorative piece right here before and after conservation. And we found one of these, um, this one is actually from the excavations of the, the planter's cottage slash kitchen of, um, up in the south yard, but we also found one from down at the uh, Mount Pleasant excavations. Similar, but not exactly a match, we double checked. Machine parts, so lots of different kinds of machine parts. Uh, the machine parts that I think of when I think of Montpelier are these threshing machine parts. So you can see the before and after of these threshing teeth, um, but this is a shot of looking into our drawer in, in the lab um, with the picture of what a threshing machine looks like. So the purpose of a threshing machine is to remove the usable part of the wheat from the part of the wheat you don't use. Um, we had several of these machines on the property, a, a more permanent one and a sort of portable one. And the majority of these parts were found in a building that you may hear us refer to as, uh, uh, or near a building that you he hear us refer to as the tobacco barn or the tobacco barn quarter. Um, so we found this really cool barn that started its life as a tobacco barn. Um, it's down in the home farm area of the property. Tobacco barns have a unique architectural style from other barns, so that's really helpful. But then we um, started finding these machine parts around there relating to um, the shift over of the plantation from being primarily a tobacco plantation to a wheat plantation. 
So that shift is something that happens all over the mid-Atlantic sort of simultaneously at, after the sort of collapse of the tobacco market and the degradations of the soils. But um, what's really fun about these threshing machine parts um, is that they also go really nicely with our documentary record. So we have references to Madison and Jefferson in letters writing about threshing machines to each other, kind of it's the latest technology. There's even a reference to Payne trying to take the threshing machine at one point. Is that right, Matt? I can see you, so nod if that's right. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you for the assist. <laughs> um, we also find all sorts of tools. I really like tools. Um, I wish we found more of them. Often the parts that we find are just the little bit, sort of the collar of the tool that would go around a wooden handle. But here's a, a, some blades and then um, a, a hoe blade. So the one on the left is a hoe blade, sort of the before and after, um, that is currently on display uh, as part of the Mere Distinction of Color exhibit. But tools are incredibly of a powerful thing, I think, to think about on a plantation. Because on the one hand, you can look at them as you know, simply a tool blade or a saw blade or, or a hammer. But when we talk to members of the descendant community often about these objects, they, they think of them as, imagine what you're hand, holding in your hand is really could be used as a weapon, could be very much of a powerful thing. And sort of the experience of being enslaved, of being um, sort of, that the enslavers trust the system of slavery so wholeheartedly that they would um, arm the enslaved population with such deadly objects. And it's because the system of slavery is so omnipresent and so governing of everything that, that, that enslaved people did that, that even something that seems as, as, as powerful, that could be as dangerous as, as a saw or a hoe or a shovel um, can, can even you know, be, be, the power of that can be taken away from you. And I just love the idea of these things being in someone's hand, the, the sort of um, connection that archeologists I think feel to tools is maybe a little, maybe not need, unique for our field because other people who work with tools may feel the same way, but we all have our favorite shovels. We have our personal trowels that, you know, we've uh, fit just in our hand just right. We've shaped the blade just right. We've sharpened it the way we like it. And I think there's just such a powerful connection between these tools and the, and the person that used them as, you know, that's my favorite shovel, that's my, my go-to um, object, and how connected you can, you can feel to those. I think so often we think about those personal connections in, in sort of the small finds, like the jewelry, um, the beads, but I, I think tools have a lot of those personal connections as well. So I, I just tend to really like them um, and, and find them to be, to be really interesting. Um, and personal. Sort of related are blacksmithing objects. So what you see on the right is uh, the tip of a tong from a blacksmithing tong. So their tools, what they would have used um, in their work. What you see on the left in the blue and sort of in the, the black above it is nail stock. So nail stock is um, kind of these long um, of rods of iron that would have been used to make uh, nails out of. So um, you would often get a lot of nail stock that you could then cut and shape into nails. And then that rusty blob of a thing that you see on top is an object that has not conserved, uh, but is still incredibly cool. It's a piece of clipped iron. So a little bit of iron that um, has sort of a, a clipped edge to it. Um, that's debris, sort of the blacksmith cut it off of something else that they were shaping or making or using. So um, we found a lot of blacksmithing related stuff um, near the, uh, uh, the Pinalay excavations in, in and around the temple because there is an 18th century blacksmith shop over in that area. A lot of that stuff has been conserved. A lot of it just hasn't had its post-conservation pictures taken yet. So it's sort of still waiting to go through that last step. Um, but really kind of neat things about the work of blacksmithing, but also uh, I love it when our, our blacksmith colleague comes in and says, this is how this tool was repaired, or this is how this object was repaired or reshaped or repurposed. Um, I think it's also really important to think about iron objects and, and the, rela the relationship to slavery and to bondage. Um, so questions we do get asked a lot are, you know, do you find shackles? Um, we have found one shackle on the property. It is the one that you see on the left here. 
uh, before and after conservation. It was found during metal detecting um, around uh, the visitor center. Uh, the other object was also found during a metal detecting survey, and it is a shackle key, which is what you see on the right. Um, shackles would have been important primarily for when you're transporting enslaved people. Um, uh, so if you're taking someone to be sold or you have recently purchased someone and you are bringing them to the plantation, that would have been an important uh, uh, component of it. But it is uh, powerful. They are um, haunting. Um, they are rare finds on this property. And I think that really speaks to the generations of enslaved people, um, the people that are born in here, you know, second, third, and sometimes fourth, fifth, sixth generation onto this property, um, that they're not bringing, you know, they're not being bought and sold and brought onto the property. Um, but their whole life is, is, is really this place. So I think these objects are really incredibly powerful. The, um, the shave, slave shackle itself is part of the mere distinction of color exhibit and the key is on display in the lab right now. Um, so you may have seen that before. But I just think it's always really important as we think about these iron objects where it's so easy, I think often to, to separate iron objects from the people that would have used them, um, would have been bond, uh, bound by them but they can be just as personal as those small finds. And I think that's an important thing to remember. Um, uh, so this is an example of what an artifact looks like when it gets sent down to us, kind of sitting on its tinfoil burrito. Um, and these are, let's see, oh, they are gonna all come up behind us. Oh no, there was a whole bunch of other really cool artifacts to show you, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing for right now. But I think one of the things that I really, um, iron is not my favorite. It is not generally my favorite object, um, sort of uh, in, in when I think about it in abstract. But one of the things that I really enjoyed about putting together this presentation was thinking about what is it about artifacts that I get excited about. And it is always that personal connection. And really thinking about iron in a new way, about making those personal connections was really sort of um, an enjoyable experience for me. So thank you all for being here because this was a, a good exercise for me to remember how personal so many of these things are. A key, um, the hands that held that key, was that a key that was held on Dolly Madison's key ring that an enslaved person had to check out from her to be able to get into a locked structure? You know, so the two hands that would have held that key that would have had access to it, the hands that held the shovels, the hands that were um, shackled by, by the shackles that we find. And, and then to think about the care that we put into conserving iron artifacts. It makes it feel all that much more important. Um, so many iron artifacts, you know, the, so many artifacts when they come down here, we wash them, we catalog, you know, we box them. But for these iron artifacts, we spend weeks removing the rust, caring for them, tending to them, and then over the years, always checking in on them, um, cleaning them more, Remo sometimes removing all the coating and conserving them all over again. And it just feels like that care um, for these objects feels that much more important um, after I was sort of working on this presentation and really thinking about, you know, um, the hands that, that, you know, held these or were held by these originally. So um, this, that was really fun, fun, maybe it's not the right word, but uh, it was really nice uh, to be able to put this together. Most of the other presentations I've shown you all, for those of you who've been on these other talks, were really came from catalog trainings we do for our staff. And this one I had to pull from a catalog training that Matt does on nails, plus um, one that we've done, Ben has put together on conservation, plus, um, a whole bunch of other stuff that we didn't have a, a training on. So it was, it was kind of a really fun exercise. So I'm really excited now moving forward that I have this presentation to show future field school students, future interns um, about sort of why iron can be a really exciting and, and really important and help fill in um, sort of these gaps. So does anybody have any questions? One thing, Mary, to add about the yeah. iron is what I've always found fascinating, especially with Montpelier, is it's other than animal bone, it's one of the few artifact types that was actually made here at Montpelier. Animal bone, of course, was made at Montpelier because the, the sheep, the pigs, the cows are all born at Montpelier and they were raised by the enslaved Americans at Montpelier. But the blacksmithing 
that has been going on at Montpelier, was going on at Montpelier from the 1750s at the latest, as early as the 1730s, but definitely by the 1750s, all the way through to when, the Madi when Dolly Madison sold the estate and all the enslaved Americans. So having these objects that were not only used, but then made is just so cool, you know, on the property. You can, uh, it's just a real, like, because with a lot of odd items, like a nail that's machine cut, you know, is used, but the hand crafting that goes into those hand forged nails and probably the definitely the tools like the hose, the, the saw blades, the locks are probably made in England as well as the cutlery, but um, spoons and even we've got some evidence of casting that might have been occurring here because we've got Dennis and Lance over at the temple found this massive blob of iron that was melted and there's firebacks that we've got that are really in bad, just like it looks like almost a miscasting. So it could be that, you know, they're casting out it as well, which is just so cool. I think it's also really important that, um, I think so often in just sort of the general talk about plantations and slavery, um, so often people divide into, well, field slaves and domestic slaves. And there's this whole group of highly skilled artisans like blacksmiths who were incredibly talented, incredibly skilled and knowledgeable. And the the, the skill and knowledge um, that it takes to do that work is so, so vital to the place um, to help it run, but also like the importance of having that skill and, and really representing that work, I think on a plantation is also really important in how we do our interpretation. And so often it feels like it gets left out um, because it's sort of this uh, in-between area. And I think in a lot of our work to kind of tell a more complete history, whether it's, it's often including maybe some of that middle ground, you know, what is it like for this artisan group, for these people with these skills? And, and you know, how do you make uh, sure that your child learns these skills so they become incredibly valuable as well? And, and I think that um, it's a really important component. All right, oh, we have a question from Wendy and I'm gonna let Matt answer it. And it is, do we know why pinched nails were pinched? Because Matt likes to talk about nails. <laughs> The, for the clinched nails? No, no, the pinched, the face pinched versus the side pinched. Oh, the, the face pinched, yeah, for the machine cut. Um, early on with the cut nail manufacturer, facturing the, um, the, the nail would be cut out in the cookie cutter shape like a wedge. And the early, like the first 30 years, 20 years of nail manufacturing, how they would grab the nail would be on the, um, on the side where it's thinnest. And that would, and then they would smack the head on it, and that would pinch the side right under the head. It makes the head really pronounced. But then later on, with the manufacturer, they figured out that if you grab the face and then smack the head on it, it doesn't get that that wasting and that weakening of the nail head. And it, um, it so like when you look at masonry nails today, the cut nails that are masonry nails, they're all um, they're all uh, face pinched, which it doesn't have that wasting. Excellent, thank you. I knew you'd give a better answer than that. <laughs> um, we've got another question. So question about rust. Does it build up on an object or is there a concern about removing too much and destroying the object underneath? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I mentioned in the very beginning that ideally we would want to have an x-ray machine and that's to make sure um, uh, how much of the, the iron of the object is still intact. Um, we are very cautious about removing too much rust. Um, sometimes the rust is the only thing that's holding things together. So in lieu of having access to an x-ray machine, um, which we could not safely do in this lab, we could not safely have an x-ray machine here, um, we are very, very cautious in our rust removal. So it often means that we are, you know, we're checking on, if it's in the, the tanks for the electrolytic reduction, we are checking on the artifact every day. Um, if we're doing, uh, sometimes actually doing the mechanical removal is more gentle because you are there yourself doing it, watching it. So the sandblasting or um, even just sort of the brushing. So um, you could definitely break uh, if you were, you could break the object underneath. You could even, if you left something in a tank way too long, let's say you put it in the tank um, and you didn't wash it and you went out of town for a month or two weeks or whatever, the object itself could start to destroy. So we're very cautious about that. And that's one of the reasons we take the before picture. Um, 
So the rust simultaneously kind of builds up, but also is eating the object itself as the rust is going. So you'll see these big blobs, but you'll also, it's eating um, away at the iron. Um, so when we do the electric little reduction, electrolytic reduction, what we're actually doing is basically chemically telling the rust to stop eating the artifact and go eat a sacrificial um, uh, object, which in our case are bowls we bought at the Goodwill. <laughs> um, so it's sort of like that the object, the opposite of electroplating. Um, so that is really a thing that we have to be incredibly cautious about. Um, let's see. Peggy asks, um, has there any evidence of barrel making on the property been found? Not that I know of. Matt, do you know of any evidence of barrel making? The, the only evidence that we that I know of is we did find a Cooper's draw knife in the Mount Pleasant main house. It was a beautiful one. It was actually burned, annealed, like Mary was talking about, and you could see the last resharpening on the blade. I just given all the crafts that are at Montpelier and the blacksmithing, I would not be surprised if there was a Cooper at Montpelier in uh, at least the 18th century, especially with how much tobacco was being made. They would definitely have a use for a Cooper. Yeah. Um, so the presentation, uh, Matt has recorded it and it is going to be up on YouTube um, as normal. Um, uh, okay, I also have a question. Tried evaporust or was it mentioned when I stepped away for a moment? Um, I don't know what evapor ev evaporust is, but there have been over time, uh, people preceding uh, me in this lab have tried many, many, <laughs> that's waving, many, many different over the counter uh, rust removal products. All of them have been not great. Some have been very not great. And the reason often is, is those, assuming that that's what this is, those um, products are often a combination of different types of chemicals. And when they're put onto an artifact, in the future, we often don't know what those chemicals are that are on the artifact now that was put on to remove the rust. So when you're trying to remove that coating because maybe the object started to rust again, it's sort of trial and error of sort of figuring out. So we were removing stuff that was like, I think there was navel jelly, there was a, a anti-rust or a kind of a over-the-counter uh, 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 rust removal things. Rust and they were kind of, it was... A rust converter? The most evil was rust converter that I experimented with. I was using it, using it on my Land Cruiser and it worked great. So I was like, hey, let's use it on artifacts. Uh-uh, that was bad. Yeah, so it's, what's really hard is if the rust comes back and you don't know the exact chemicals that were used on an object, you don't know what chemicals you need to put on it to take that, that chemical off in order to treat the artifact again. So you have to kind of, play around with alcohol or acetone or brute force and all of these other things to get those off. And a key part of conservation is the ability to undo what you've done before. And so many of those sort of over-the-counter chemicals are really hard to undo um, if, you know, a little bit of rust comes back or some other uh, uh, component comes back. So it's really in sort of the world of artifact conservation, it's very, um, sort of mechanical removal and electrolytic reduction are sort of the core pieces of what everyone does sort of universally across the board, whether it's an underwater archaeological site or a terrestrial archaeological site. Um, it's sort of uh, the, 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 the base of um, expectation. And a lot of that also comes to the chemistry of the artifact is what's being treated through those, through particularly the electrolytic um, reduction, but through all these different processes. And that stabilizes the artifact kind of at its core. Um, and again, also tries to um, make it so the archaeologists or the curators in the future can know exactly what they're getting into when they're, they're dealing with, with these artifacts. Um, we went through and reconserved maybe two years ago everything um, that was on display, whether it had been on display, oh gosh, this is even more than that. Um, whether it had been on display in the cellar spaces before the mere distinction of color was put in, um, if it had been displayed in the visitor center, anything that any iron artifact that had been displayed anywhere on the property all got reconserved. And it was an adventure in conservation um, and, and really trying to figure out how to best um, address those different, all the different types of chemicals that had been used on. Hey, Mary, I, I just looked up evapor rust uh -huh. and it does say it's water soluble, which is 
looking like it could be a good thing, but you know, obviously whether it's actually water soluble in terms of conservation, uh, conservation standpoint or water soluble just in terms of like cylinder collects tools is a different thing. So right. there's conservation standards for like whether something is going to be, be able to be, um, uh, be stable for a hundred years versus like five years. And yeah, we'd have to look at it. But th the fact that it says water soluble is that's heading in the, the right direction. Some of the Absolutely. other ones are like, they just got into the iron and would not come out, which is awful. Um, and, and again, it's also, you know, we, we do keep records whenever we conserve an object, you do keep a, a conservation record. You write down what you did to it, what, what's been written down, but those records, you know, sometimes people will write down, I used, you know, rust to be gone and maybe rust to be gone isn't a product that's made anymore. And so that's ne not necessarily, um, the most helpful thing for the future. So kind of keeping and, and what is relatively speaking sort of a narrow framework um, and sort of keeping with conservation standards really helps us with, um, for the people of the future that may not uh, be able to find our records or know exactly what it means, it, it kind of preserves it by um, keeping to sort of the industry standard. Awesome. Any other questions does anybody have? Well, thank you guys so much. Um, this was really fun. I really enjoyed having so many of you on here. Like I said, this was actually fun for me because it kind of pushed me a little out of my comfort zone. Um, but I also just to, you know, keep your eyes open on your email, Matt and I are scheduling a whole bunch more uh, lunch and learns, um, uh, some more even of these sort of artifact based ones, um, but kind of, keep your eyes peeled. The schedule should be going out pretty soon for the ones through October. Um, so and next um, week, I, we paired this one uh, for the one that's next week, because next week on Wednesday, um, we're going to be out at the blacksmith site with Dennis and doing a uh, lunch and learn on metal detecting. So I'm going to try to see if we can start it out as a uh, PowerPoint out in the field and then switch over to the phone and go and visit Dennis at the, uh, the site. We'll see how that works. I'm gonna try to see if I can set up the Wi-Fi right at the blacksmith shop. But this is a nice lead in for all that. So thanks, Mary. Perfect, well, I'm happy to do it. And thank you all so much. If you also, um, if you really like coming to these and there's a topic you really want us to talk about, shoot us an email. Um, email us at dig at montpelier.org and say, I really wanna hear a presentation about the law. Um, and we can uh, uh, figure out how to make it work. Oh, and also if anybody wants this, uh, uh, um, Nancy asked if this is recorded. We are recording this, so I'm gonna put it on YouTube. If anybody wants the link for this, you could email me directly at mreeves at montpelier.org or uh, Sarah Lee at dig at Montpelier and we'll send you the, uh, the link. We need to figure out a place for all these links to live. I've got it in like a, Google Doc, but that's not very friendly. So, um, but yeah, so it's recorded. Awesome. Thanks, right. Mary. Bye. Good seeing everybody.